welcome to ODF and uh, Oregon Department of Forestry and Department of Environmental Quality's information session and public hearing for the proposed rules on the Oregon Smoke Management Plan, the DQ's inclusion of the changes to the smoke or to the smoke management plan as part of the Oregon Clean Air Act State Implementation Plan. Now, the Oregon Smoke Management Plan is a uh, plan governing prescribed burning. It's the use of, use of, of a planned fire in the woods, in the forest, uh, for a number of different ends. We'll get into that. Um, this, does, uh, this information session and hearing involve a prescribed fire uh, as a tool and as a program and inclusion into ODF's rules. They're the ones who govern those rules, but also in uh, tandem with the Department of Environmental Quality uh, as part of our overall for the state of Oregon, our Clean Air Act, an agreement we have with EPA uh, to manage the Clean Air Act in Oregon. My name is Peter Brewer. I'm an air quality specialist uh, with DEQ. Uh, I'm in the Bend office. That's where my day-to-day -day office is, but I do different parts of my work is smoke in particular, uh, particular matter either all over Central Eastern Oregon or all over the state. And uh, with me tonight. My name is Tim Walshbach. I'm serve as the Fire Prevention and Policy Manager with the Department of Forestry. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be serving as the hearings officers uh, for tonight for our respective agencies. Again, this is a, a dual uh, effort by Oregon Department of Forestry and DEQ. The purpose of this information meeting and public hearing is to provide information about the proposed changes to the Oregon Smoke Management Plan and to take public comment on the proposed action to adopt and or amend the Smoke Management Plan uh, implemented by OBF and DEQ's inclusion of the, the, the plan and those rules uh, as part of our uh, Clean Air Act and adopted by the Environmental Quality Commission. That's the overall overseeing commission of DEQ. The state implementation plan is Oregon's agreement with EPA through the rules and program plans. It includes not only the smoke management plan, but also the implementing directives or guidance documents uh, known as uh, the smoke management plan directive. Uh, those two documents together is what DEQ pulled into our rules uh, as part of the Oregon Clean Air Act. Uh, the evening uh, tonight will consist of three parts. First, an information session uh, where we'll present uh, information on the changes uh, by both agencies, on the proposed changes, and about background of the plan, uh, and leading up to those changes, the specific ones to this making effort. And then we'll have a joint uh, public hearing uh, through both agencies, the uh, Department of Forestry and DEQ. That's it. The back half, I should say, of the meeting, really the two parts, because we combine that for efficiencies. Uh, we'll begin the hearings uh, after the information session. Uh, but in the information session, it's your chance to, to ask questions after uh, this session. We'll get questions at the end so we can get through. Like that? There we go. I've never been on stage. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. Um, but it's your chance to, uh, to ask those questions uh, at the end of the, the uh, information session and you have, have the opportunity to have questions answered to so find out uh, the information you need uh, about the program and the proposed changes. Uh, and that's the time for interaction with the agencies at the, hear at the time of the hearing and providing comment. That's really a one way directional. We take comment, we don't answer. Uh, back, we listen, we receive, and we respond to that uh, later in time. I'm going to cover some of the logistical items for tonight. Um, we appreciate if anyone slipped by and didn't have a chance to sign in on the sign in sheet by the door. Please make sure you do so tonight so we can record that you are here. Um, for any folks joining on the phone, we'll uh, Take your uh, names and uh, we record you to the uh, sign-in sheet uh, at the appropriate time when the hearing starts. Those not wishing to make oral comments may also submit handwritten comments by completing a comment card tonight 
or through our respective agencies online method or also by a by mail or email and there's information on the, on the back table there by the entrance on various ways to provide written comment to the agencies uh, each person wishing to comment orally at this hearing will uh, cover that when we uh, open up the uh, hearing process after the information and the q a session is completed a little bit more housekeeping, the location of the reference, as Michael mentioned, are above the door to the right, and they're all the way down on the end. They'll be on your left hand side as you walk down the hallway. Um, no smoking inside the facility. And uh, also, for your cell phones, if you could please mute them or turn them off so you can proceed through. Uh, the hearing is being recorded. You're so going to have to speak up more. You're competing back here. Sounds good. Thank you. He reminded me as well, so I can keep that on the desk as well. So uh, for cell phones, turn them off. This hearing has been recorded, so we make sure that we can uh, record and uh, take note of all those comments and that we don't miss anything. So having a cell phones not ringing in the middle is also appreciated. So along with that, we'd like to introduce uh, Nick Yonker and Michael Orman to uh, start the information session. Started through the information item and apologize for getting up on stage. I need to click this slide. So the objective of our meeting today with this information item is to run through the background of how the program operates, our smoke management program, summarize our plan changes and the proposals that we have, um, discuss the next steps for our rulemaking, and answer some questions if we have time. And we've got a lot of folks who want to provide comment and we want to make sure and provide enough time for folks to do that. So we're going to move quickly through and answer as many questions as we can. So as uh, Peter mentioned, we've got uh, two different programs or two different agencies working together on the smoke management plan update. ODF works with the rules. They, they write the rules and implement those rules and they get approval from the Board of Forestry to implement their program. Whereas DEQ works in tandem with ODF and manages um, air quality aspects of our smoke management plan and takes our directed guidance and runs that through the Environmental Quality Commission for re review and approval before we send it to the uh, EPA for their review and approval. Here's uh, some rules, uh, rule citations for the program. Again, DEQ's role in the program is to monitor our air quality throughout Oregon and make sure that we are monitoring the impacts from prescribed burning. And every five years, we come together as a, a two agencies to review our program, make sure that we incorporate best practices, and uh, update the program as needed to meet the needs of Oregonians. So one of the objectives of smoke management is uh, the use of prescribed burning to manage wildfire risk. Um, it's also used to, as a fuels management production technique. It's used to improve ecosystem health within our forests. And it's improved to, uh, it's, it's used to eliminate uh, unwanted debris and wood waste. Well, with that, with that burning activity comes smoke. And DEQ is really concerned about the smoke uh, that comes from our prescribed burning activities. Um, smoke is made up of a, a couple different pollutants, mainly small particles, carbon monoxide, and hydrocarbons. And these small particles are small enough to get deep within our lungs and actually pass through our lungs and into our bloodstream, and that causes some health concerns. Uh, it's, it's especially concerning for at-risk groups, like children and the elderly, and people with pre-existing conditions. So part of the balance of our smoke management plan is to use prescribed burning as a wildfire risk reduction technique, but also to, manage, to balance the protection of our air quality within our communities. So, um, protection of our air quality is threefold. We're protecting against what's called the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, which are standards that are set at the national level uh, by EPA and they're protective of health. And for PM 2.5, it's a 24-hour average. So we measure air quality through the day and compare against the value that EPA has established. And if we are above the, the established value, then we're not in compliance with that value. So we're, we're trying to keep our air quality below that threshold. We're also protecting against smoke sensitive and high risk groups, which typically experience uh, impacts from smoke at lower concentrations than the national ambient air quality standards. So we're 
We're also concerned about short-term impacts, not just the 24-hour average. And as everybody knows, we don't breathe on a 24-hour average. We're constantly breathing. And so we want to make sure and take that into consideration. And then we're also concerned about the visibility in our Class 1 areas. And that's our, our national park in Oregon, and also the, a couple wilderness areas throughout Oregon that we'll see well, later in the slides. So uh, protecting air quality standards is the most basic part of our program. We have monitored networks set up throughout Oregon, and we monitor those, uh, the air quality in, in these locations to see if smoke from prescribed burning is entering these uh, locations. We have an air quality monitor in, in Medford, for instance, and um, we're, we're watching that to make sure we, see, we can monitor the impact from smoke. Um, as I mentioned, there's a 24-hour average, and we're also concerned about the short-term impacts from smoke. So this image here is, um, calls out our non-attainment areas. And so those are the areas in Oregon that aren't meeting the standard for, that's set by EPA, that health-based standard. So the red dots, Oak Ridge, and Klamath Falls are areas where we're not, we're not in attainment. So DEQ is working with those communities to um, establish rules or change practices to reduce the pollution in those locations to meet the ambient air quality standards. Um, the blue dots are areas where DEQ is concerned about attainment with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. So we're, we're inching up to that level and we're, we're working with those communities proactively uh, before they, they exceed that threshold to keep the pollution down below the, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. And then the green triangles are just areas where we're watching to see if smoke is entering these locations. <laughs> so <everyone. laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're DEQ's impacts from short-term smoke, so smoke that might enter a location for a short period of time and then and blow out. And that's typically how we experience a prescribed burn smoke. It doesn't typically stick around uh, longer than a couple hours, and it'll blow in really strong and then blow out. So those, those shorter-term, higher concentration impacts can also have impacts on health, and uh, we're concerned about that. And finally, we have 12 class one areas. Those are the national park, the national park and wilderness areas within our state. And um, we're monitoring the visibility in those locations to see how our, how our activities might be impacting the visibility um, and, and working to reduce our impacts on visibility in those locations over time. <coughs> this image here shows uh, the increasing fire risk, fire, fire potential throughout the U.S. And as you notice in um, the West, we are increasing, we are above normal for wildfire risk. And so that's concerning because um, as you've experienced this year, we have an increase in wildfire smoke that comes along with that. So it, this, this is a balancing act between using prescribed burning to reduce our fire risks and also monitoring the impacts from prescribed burning um, and its impacts on public health from smoke. And ODF and DEQ work in, uh, collaboratively in this space to make the, to increase our pace and scale of prescribed burning and reducing wildfire risk while at the same time managing the, the smoke that comes from those activities. For instance, in 2017, we had, a, we had over 160 days of unhealthy for sensitive groups, which is a a uh, descriptor that we use um, from our air quality um, air quality index, and uh, that's air where it's unhealthy um, for those uh, those at-risk groups, children, the elderly, folks with pre-existing conditions. And uh, we had over 160 days in 2017, and we're seeing an increasing trend in that this year. <coughs> and now I'll hand it off to Nick to continue the presentation. Thank you, Michael. So my role as a smoke management program manager, I will tell you about our smoke management program, how it operates on a day-to-day -day basis, and then I'll go into our smoke management review, which got us to the <coughs> point to come up with uh, new rules that are going forth for these uh, public hearings, and then we'll go on to, uh, for approval for our Board of Forestry and DEQ's Department of Environmental Quality, or their Environmental Quality Commission. So our program has been around for quite some time. It started as a voluntary program, first in 1969, and uh, has been a, 
a regulatory program since 1972. And so it has been a, a long time in coming. I've been here since 1989, so I've seen a lot of program and a lot of changes that have occurred in this program. <coughs> and you'll find out that there's some considerable changes that are taking place with the, with the program as it stands right now. Our main objectives are two, essentially two key points. We're trying to keep smoke out of smoke sensitive receptor areas, which Medford Ashland area is one of those, and there's 23 uh, throughout the state. Uh, we're also trying to protect uh, or try to maximize our forest free uh, prescribed burning uh, to help uh, reduce wildfire risk, uh, create planting spots for uh, companies to uh, grow more trees and so forth and, and enjoy the wood products that we have. Uh, in addition, we try to cover uh, uh, using the, uh, our, our rules to basically uh, meet the goals of the uh, State and Federal uh, Clean Air Act and pr protect public health and promote alternatives to burning. Here's a map of our uh, smoke management regulated area. Uh, it includes some light green areas and uh, dark green areas. The light green is considered level one land, which basically means that those uh, industry folks who have to follow the smoke management plan and, and landowners who want to uh, burn their uh, slash and so forth have to follow all components of our smoke management plan. Uh, those in the uh, dark green on the east side of the Cascades are for private landowners. Uh, they do have some exemptions. Uh, they do not have to pay fees. Uh, they uh, have different reporting requirements or not as stringent reporting requirements as level one land. And the uh, forecasts that we put out and the instructions are voluntary for them. Otherwise, it's mandatory for the uh, light green or level one areas. In addition, on the uh, map, you'll see uh, hatch blue areas. Those are our 23 smoke sensor receptor areas. Those are the areas we are trying to protect at the highest level. Then we also have uh, the class one areas that uh, Michael alluded to. We actually have 12 areas, which include our Crater Lake National Park and other uh, areas that. Uh, uh, throughout the state on, in the Cascades, uh, Calumniopsis wilderness area, and on the east side of the Cascades. And these areas we protect to a lesser degree for visibility purposes. So the main thing that we're trying to do is try to keep main plume smoke from our prescribed burning out of those areas at least, or minimize them. So it's, it's not like they can't get smoke in that, that area, but it would be at a reduced level. So a little bit about how we run on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really all about forecasting. I'm a meteorologist, and we've got two other uh, smoke management meteorologists in the program. We provide the weather forecast and the instructions for uh, each day that we do burning uh, to uh, basically tell how much burning can take place and, and, and what that looks like in, in, in tonnage and spacing and things like that, which I'll go into. Two key components of uh, meteorology that uh, we need to know about and uh, forecast accurately is how well will the smoke mix upward, known as mixing height, and which direction the smoke is going to go. So when we burn, that we either are able to loft the smoke above a smoke sensor receptor area, or we want to uh, have the wind blowing away from the smoke sensor area when we're uh, when the smoke is being produced. Uh, so we got. Uh, in addition, we got the transport wind uh, that we are trying to forecast for as well, which is basically the direction in which wind is carrying that smoke to. And finally, there are some other weather factors we're concerned with, humidity, rainfall, existing air quality, things like that that are also important but uh, don't meet the, the two criteria that I've, I mentioned before, the mixing height and our transport wind. So then from those forecasts, we issue the instructions that I uh, briefly mentioned earlier, specifying how big the unit can be in, certain, in terms of tonnage. So we do have fuel models that determine how much tonnage we feel is going to burn, uh, the spacing between different units, and how close we are to a smoke sensor receptor area. There are some other aspects that we look at, elevation, river drainages, things like that. Uh, but those are some of the key things that we're looking at to provide our instructions that let the burners know how much they can burn on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, when they get that information, they contact the local forest district and say they want to burn in a certain area, 
and if it's within the instruction, they'll get the go ahead. If they may be outside the instruction, but they feel like it's not a speed. I'm sorry, but you're just going after what you're saying is nonsense. Let's be certain. I'm talking about the program right now, so this is what the information is. Okay, so anyway, so the point is, is that the, uh, the forest district uh, works with the landowner to determine how much they can burn, and if there's uh, if they're outside that instruction, we can let them call or the, the district can call us and ask for a waiver, and we'll determine whether that's uh, advisable or not. And so, uh, so there we have control over how much burning can take place on a day-to-day -day basis, and then that daily burning is tracked and monitored. We have instrumentation, uh, whether it's uh, aerial monitoring, satellite, uh, ground monitoring, cameras, so we can see where the smoke is going and where it's coming from. Here's a graphic of basically about how much we burn uh, every year. It's about 165,000 acres, ranging from about 140,000 to 210,000. And so if there's a smoke problem, uh, First, I want to mention that usually most smoke intrusions that we get from prescribed forestry burning only last a few hours, unlike wildfire smoke that you've experienced through the summer, which lasts for days and weeks at a time. Our prescribed burning smoke, since it's tightly controlled, if we do have a problem, we try to keep it out of the, uh, out of the uh, smoke sensor receptor areas, but if it does come in, usually it comes in just a few hours at a time, and then it gets cleaned out. Uh, we work with uh, DEQ to uh, consult on in smoke intrusions and if there's a problem that needs to be rectified. Uh, otherwise, uh, when we do get uh, complaints about uh, smoke coming in, usually we, we direct people to contact the local district because they're the ones who are probably doing the burning or know who's doing the burning. And at the last resort, they can contact us as well. But, Generally, we like to go to the local district, like the Southwest Oregon Medford uh, District Office for this area. Uh, ODF also prepares smoke intrusion reports to essentially uh, let people know uh, why we had the smoke intrusion. It, was it a weather issue where we got the uh, weather forecast wrong or, or we just allowed too much smoke in a certain area? It's a learning tool. It's not necessarily a punitive uh, stick uh, approach, but it's, it's a learning tool for us. And then these intrusion reports go into our annual reports, so uh, people can see, and it goes to the legislature as well, so they know how much uh, burning is taking place and what uh, smoke intrusions we're having. Uh, this is a graphic of how much uh, intrusions we've had over the last 10 years. Generally, we average about 5 to 10 smoke intrusions a year, and this is over 3, 000, approximately 3,000 units in which we burn each year. So it's a very small percentage of those units that actually cause smoke <coughs> into uh, smoke sensor receptor areas. So we, we try to keep as much smoke out of, of those sort of receptor areas as possible. Is this for the state? This is for the state, yes. What calendar time of year is that? January to December. Calendar year. So now I will go into our smoke management review and our process that we went through uh, for, for the program. Uh, essentially, as mentioned before, we have a review once every five years. Uh, we've had, since the beginning of the program, many operational and technical changes. The last review was in 2013, and you see on the screen a few items that we covered then. Mostly it was cleanup from a previous review that had a significant change that, that took place. So. This is another also significant change that we're, we're going to have, and we'll talk about that here shortly. So our current plan, uh, which uh, our review started in May of 2017 and went on through March of 2018, we had five meetings of which we had 21 members uh, of the review committee uh, from a very wide variety of, of stakeholders uh, throughout the state. Uh, let's just say we had federal landowners, uh, land managers, uh, industrial and small woodland owners. We had uh, air quality interests from whether it's uh, EPA, uh, American Lung Association, Oregon Health Authority, 
We had several of those agencies. We had environmental groups like uh, Nature Conservancy and Sierra Club, and uh, uh, plenty of folks from the public counties. Uh, we had uh, County Health, the so Lane Regional Air Protective Agency, uh, Klamath County Health, we had a Lake County Commissioner, and we had a Mayor from Ashland who was in our midst. So thank you, John Stromberg, for uh, coming out. Uh, so we had a lot of folks who provided a lot of input for us, and these are all people who are very interested in prescribed learning and, and coming up with the best possible solution for the future. So the two key uh, components that were uh, discussed and uh, came out from the review committee included changing the smoke intrusion definition. And the reason was because current, our current rule is that we don't allow, or we, an intrusion is any smoke that goes into a smoke sensor, sensitive receptor area. And that could be from very little that people don't even notice to a significant amount, usually lasting a short period of time. We are changing that definition to allow for a little bit more smoke. We want to make a health-based standard because we are concerned about the fact that we have lots of wildfire smoke that is causing a much greater amount of smoke into the community as opposed to the prescribed burning smoke. And because we're having this uh, problem, we need to do some increasing of the prescribed burning smoke that we can control versus the wildfire smoke we cannot control. So there's been a need to increase that uh, uh, or change that definition. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Because we're going to have that, in, uh, that change, our proposed change, we also feel that it's necessary that the communities that would receive that smoke, uh, however light it may be or, or, or whatever it may be, they should be getting more information from us. Currently, we don't really provide information to the community uh, as to uh, when the smoke is going to come in, uh, how much, or, or whatever that may be. We're here to try to change that. It's not going to be an easy process. We have to work with communities that, uh, the smoke sensitive receptor area communities that have the most problems with smoke. We start there first and we try to work with the local health agency there to notify the agency how much uh, burning we have in that area so they can be aware and they can be able to notify the rest of the community. How that all looks, I can't give you a, a, a complete picture right now that is being worked on, but uh, that's another thing is the idea is that we need to communicate to the communities <coughs> why we burn and when smoke possibly could get in the community so people can take action to either get away from the smoke or shelter in place in their homes, close up their windows and things like that. Uh, these recommendations that came out of the review committee uh, have been uh, approved through uh, and supported by ODF and DEQ and they went to our Board of Forestry for permission to go out for rulemaking and that's why we're having these public hearings. Uh, during that uh, hearing, that we're, or not the hearing, but the meeting at the Board of Forestry in June, the Board of Forestry decided that uh, one of the uh, components, the intrusion definition, which includes a short-term impact or an hourly impact and how much uh, smoke comes in at an hourly level versus a 24-hour average, which is based off of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards that uh, Michael had already mentioned. They felt like that if there is a good community response plan already in place that's approved by the local community, city council, commissioners, and so forth, if that's been approved, that there could be an exemption process to uh, do away with, for that community, the short-term impact. We'll talk about that in a little in a little bit, but these are just the high-level uh, look at what was discussed in those in, that, in the review. So I'm going to go through the entire review that included uh, things that weren't even discussed in the review committee, but all the things that are in this smoke management rule that's being proposed and what's what you'll be discussing in the hearing. So the first one is talking about the smoke intrusions. So uh, there are two parts to that smoke intrusion. What's the short-term impact on an hourly basis, and what's the long-term or 24-hour average impact? 
So at the short term level, this is what we have right now. Our, our smoke can be measured, it's only measured in a short term impact. We don't consider a 24 hour average in our current intrusions. We consider light, moderate, or heavy intrusion. I'm not gonna try to explain how we determine light, moderate, or heavy. That gets a little bit too much detail. But the point is, is that what we're looking at is two tests. One is the short term, where we're trying to prevent a certain amount of smoke at the short term level, which is... Please turn off your phone. Or um, we're trying to avoid greater than 70 micrograms per cubic meter, and I know you probably don't know what that means exactly, of particulate matter 2.5. Uh, Michael mentioned this. This is the type of uh, particulate that comes into your lungs, and, uh, goes deep into your lungs. It's, it's the worst kind of uh, particulate to go into your lungs. It causes the most respiratory illness and so forth. So 70 micrograms is our threshold there. And then at the 24-hour average level, it's 26 micrograms. The National Ambient Air Quality Standards are 35 micrograms. So we're keeping the 24-hour average about 25% lower than what the 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So while that may be a little complicated to explain all that, we are trying to make this a health-based standard. And the, the point is, is that we want to keep smoke out at the short-term level as well as the long-term level, because there's two components here of considering <laughs> your short-term breathing versus your long-term breathing and, and so forth. So, and the, that 35 micrograms per cubic meter is a standard that we, it's like a hard stop for us um, levied by the EPA. Next, we also have a few other items that are, are uh, minor items that I want to mention. Our objectives will change a little bit based off of the new uh, rules that I mentioned before on the intrusion definition and a couple of other items. So looking at minimizing smoke and avoiding smoke intrusions based off of the new definition. We also are including uh, in our set and one of the sections in our rule, uh, the necessity of safeguarding public health as well as what we have already in there, necessity for correct burning. So it felt like we needed to have balance in our rule to say that we're concerned about air quality as well as prescribed burning. But it was, why it was in there before, it may have been an oversight uh, of how, uh, how it was put in there. But the idea of the rule is essentially show why both uh, factors that we have in there are important for the community. So I'm going to park on this a little bit more. This is the intrusion. Uh, definition issue. So I talked a little bit up, a bit about uh, the 24-hour and the one-hour uh, thresholds. That's number three. We're changing, remember I talked to you about intensity, light, moderate, or heavy. We're doing away with those and we're just going with magnitude. So the term 70 micrograms per cubic meter gives a magnitude of how much smoke is in the air. And so that's the way we're going to do it. So it's going to be in a particulate matter amount and not a, uh, another method called the light scattering method, which we use right now. So a little bit in the weeds, but we need to tell you what this all entails. Another important uh, aspect of intrusion definition to, for you to understand is that, like I mentioned, it's a health-based standard. So we're concerned about how much total particulate is in the atmosphere that would make a smoke intrusion. Currently, we're concerned about how much smoke above the level of the background smoke is. In other words, what was in the air before the smoke came in? So we, there's pollution in the air all the time, and hopefully most of the time it's pretty clean. But today it's, it's quite dirty, and so we've got levels definitely well above 70 micrograms uh, right now. So uh, to give you an example, if we put smoke into a certain area, then uh, what would, we would look at to determine a smoke intrusion is what was the level beforehand? We pick out a three hour average, and then how much did it go up, and when did it go down to determine the length of the intrusion? The new way of doing it is gonna say, we're not concerned about how much we raise it above the background is, we have a ceiling. 
regardless of what the air looked like beforehand, we have a ceiling at the short-term level at 70 micrograms and 26 micrograms for a 24-hour average. So if it's polluted already, we're not going to be burning anymore. Before or currently, we can add more to that and have it be a light intrusion or a moderate or something like that. So hopefully you understand that, that basically we're focusing on the fact that total health, how much is in the air. So it's not a matter of how much we put in. If we put in some, but wood stoves or local burning or any other type of burning is also putting smoke in the air, we need to voluntarily, voluntarily cut back. So that's another key component. And finally, uh, our reporting requirements are a little bit different. So what we have in the future proposed is that if it's below the threshold of an intrusion, 70 micrograms per an hour, or 26 for a 24 hour average, we have what's called a smoke incident. It'd be a, it's a small amount of reporting, just a, you know, who, what, why, where, when, and we get it through. It's a lot of work for us in the, uh, in the office to do these smoke intrusion reports. The 70 microgram hourly and the 26, uh, uh, 24 hour average at that level or above is a smoke intrusion. So we'll do similar reporting as we do now. And then if we go above 35 micrograms for the 24 hour standard, then that's a smoke intrusion that exceeds the ambient air quality standards. And that would require even more in depth study to, to determine how to prevent that. So that's some detail that uh, you need to understand. So I wanted to get that out. Uh, then we have a few other things, special protection zones, which are areas that have historically been in the past non-attainment areas. In other words, areas that have been uh, getting too much pollution in that area from uh, particulate matter. Um, we're putting that information into our smoke management rule and not in the directive that we have right now because we feel like the provisions in that directive on special protection zones, which occur, we protect for during the winter months when we can have wood stove smoke and other pollutants that uh, are affecting the atmosphere. That's what we want to get in the rules so it, it, it has a little bit more teeth to it. The other key component is the uh, smoke response plans <coughs> for the communities. So these will be, we're going for, the main areas we're going for are the areas that have problems with smoke intrusions. Probably Medford, Ashland area will also have a smoke uh, community response plan. Areas like Bend, John Day, Baker City, Eugene area are areas that will likely be the first to have uh, a community response plan. But we have to work with the community to make sure that this is a successful program so we can get the information out to the community so they can be aware and do what they can to avoid smoke that may be getting into the community. We do have a few other things. Another key component uh, that was outside of our review is that the increased usage of a polyethylene plastic sheeting on piles because we find that dry piles burn a whole lot more efficient and cleaner than wet piles do. As you know, in the west side of Oregon, we get lots of rain in the fall. And that's when pile burning takes place. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a good, clean burn. And so the landowners cannot get to all of their piles right away when it just starts to rain. So they need to cover some of those piles. And when you burn a pile that's covered by a couple pounds of polyethylene, which is no more toxic to burn than the woody material, and this has been proven by lab studies, that this uh, is a bit much more efficient and better way to burn and keeping smoke out of communities and or minimizing it. So uh, we've got that approval uh, with DEQ and so that's, that's our proposal to allow for greater usage of that polyethylene and uh, reduce the pollution that way. A few other items. Uh, National ambient air quality exceedances that I mentioned for those intrusions that do exceed will have a special reporting in our annual report so people can see what we're doing to try to prevent those from occurring in the future. And then we have a few uh, additional minor changes, most, mostly grammatical wording changes. So that's all part of most cleanup in, in a rule. So our next steps, uh, we have the five hearings. This is our fifth hearing, our last hearing. 
Uh, we'll be talking about getting uh, your written comments up. Uh, just to let you know that 5 p.m. September 14th is the last day to get in your written comments to us. We do have uh, information on where you can send that in, uh, to. A lot of that stuff has got taken. I know some people have it, and so we weren't expecting this month, many people uh, tonight, so uh, uh, we ran out of the materials, but we'll, we'll get that information for those who want it. Um, this will eventually go to uh, our Board of Forestry in November, and then to the Environmental Quality Commission in January for approval. If there's any problems between either boards, then whatever is the issue will be taken off and we approve what we both can agree to. This is the DEQ website information. Like I said, it was on a handout that probably was snapped up pretty quickly. And then this is uh, DEQs, and this is Support Department of Forestry website. So uh, if you want to, afterwards we can uh, get more of that information to you. I, whether we email it to you or give it to you tonight. And finally, uh, we'll be going into the hearing procedure. I will just leave this up for now uh, so you can kind of see what's expected uh, in the hearing process. Uh, our hearing officers have kind of explained it a little bit. They'll explain it some more. But uh, just wanted to uh, keep that up so you can kind of read through that so you can uh, see what you want to do. From here, uh, both Michael and I will uh, take any questions you have regarding the air quality or the uh, smoke management plan part. Michael, you got Yeah, just one sec. I want to see how many people we have. I want to make sure we have enough time to answer your questions and also hear your comments. And that's, made, that's one of the more important parts of our day. Okay, got time. So let's start at the front. We'll work with Yeah, the question was uh, stakeholders on the on the review committee. Um, let's see if I can get it right now. There's uh, public health advocates. We had OHA. We had the American Lung Association. We had members from the public. We had industrial forest uh, landowners. Uh, we had small woodland landowners. We had federal. I guess Forest Service was on our committee. There's actually a website that I could provide after that has a, a list of all the membership and um, uh, comments that they might have provided during the, the committee review if you'd like to take a look at that too. Okay. Okay. Uh, question about alternatives to burning. Um, so, so, uh, so we have two different things that we are concerned that can help with um, keeping the air quality clean. One is alternative spurring. That means that an alternative that we don't light a match to. So we can do things like we can chip biomass, uh, take it off the land to take it to a, a place that it can be a, a biomass for um, fuel and electricity and so forth. Uh, it can be uh, crushed and you know spread, spread around. So there's a number of different ways in which we can have alternatives to allow for creating more planting spots or just keeping uh, uh, the fuel where it's not necessary to burn it all, uh, but to uh, use another method in which to get it get at it. Mowing can also be done in some areas. Uh, so there's there's a number of them. I can't think of all of them, but there's, there's that gives you kind of a flavor of what we do. We also have emission reduction techniques. So in other words. We do light the match, but we do the, the burning more efficiently. Uh, pile burning is more efficient than doing broadcast burning, like a field burn. So you burn the whole area, as opposed to just piling up in one area because you create heat concentrations and that more heat, better uh, efficiency of burning. Uh, also, putting on polyethylene is another way of a emission reduction technique, as I, as I mentioned before. So that gives you some other uh, ways in which we try to keep uh, our, the efficiency of burning the best. Yes, sir? It seems to me that uh, the major justification for prescribed burning would be, as you already mentioned in your introductory comments, to decrease the incidence of forest fire. What is the evidence that it does that? There are studies out there that do talk about that and, and, and 
how that works. Uh, I would say that the idea is that, um, I can't give you statistics right now, but the idea is that if you burn an area with prescribed burning, that if at a later date, within a few years, you don't want to be too, too long because then fuel builds up again, uh, that if a forest fire goes through that area, then that reduces the uh, amount of fuel that's in that area so the fire lays down much lower and burns at a lower intensity in that area. You can say that forest fire may be much bigger and that it just goes around it and so forth. There's all sorts of arguments you can make on that. But historically, our fires in the past, and the distant past from the time of the pioneers and the Indians and so forth, basically burn at, at a very low level, and that's because fires repeated themselves over and over again every few years. And since uh, the early 1900s, we've been suppressing fires, smoky bear and everything, and we found out that that's not necessarily the best thing. Our forests were meant to burn, that's how they regenerate, that's how they stay healthy, and what we have now is we have large tracts of carpets of green, which looks great, but in reality, it makes for a great wildfire, and which is not a good thing. So those are those are some of the things I can mention about the may, wildfire issue. May I just, just add something to that? Ashland's been very involved in one of the leading projects to do this, and I can sense that there is a, an idea in the room that we go out and and we start setting off the the forest using fire to make it safer. Well, that there's a really important intermediate step. The fact that we've been putting out fires for 100 years now has allowed an accumulation, and you could really see it in the Ashland water shed, of all sorts of plant material, very thin, sick trees <coughs> crowding out big ponderosas, all that kind of stuff. So the first thing you do in the, the approach that we've been using is you go in and with mechanical means, cutting and yes. chopping and, and pulling out, you get that, that excess stuff which allows the fire that gets started to go right up to the crown. That the, the fire, the forests are sort of set up to have really bad fires when they're choked with all that stuff. When you get that material and you get the fuel levels down, then the, it all starts growing back, but it takes, it takes a while to grow back. And we've done scientific studies that show that in the forest when it was in more balance and wasn't so susceptible to really bad fires, fire would move through the forest, started by one cause or another, sometimes even human beings through the Native American. And it would burn up this at, the, at nearly the ground level, but without damaging the duct, it will burn that, that material out. And so you really reduce the chance of getting a serious fire. And you also reduce the chance for us of sources of ignition. We had 100 lightning strikes around Ashland a couple of weeks ago. Sources of ignition getting into the town because Ashland is extremely susceptible fire, so we're very sensitive about this. The controlled burning is, is used primarily to keep the fuel levels down. Sorry, do have enough time? I'll speak to you. Excuse me? Let, let him finish. We'll, we'll uh, yeah. take more questions. I'm just so, explaining what, what we talked about. Why are we not talking about logging? We're talking about just... No, let me, let me finish. finish. That's, That's, so here's the interesting... There's really... There's some, some really interesting aspects of this. When you get that initial bunch of extra fuel out, you have to do something with it. And we've been doing pile burnings. There are technologies that are really better where you burn it at about 2,000 degrees. It makes almost no smoke, and you get biochar. But the terrain is so rugged that we, nobody has developed a way of bringing that in or getting the materials out. But that's something I believe needs to be worked on. The gentleman up here asked, what about logging? In this Ashland Forest Resiliency Project that we did, which is, deals with, is very sensitive to all kinds of environmental issues. We took out, took to the mills almost $6 million worth of logs, which incidentally were also very high quality timber. And that helped the economy. And those things were needed to be removed because
because they were crowding out other stuff. So there's that was a possibility also in this thinning process of significant amount. I think 3,000 truckloads of logs went through the mountain going to the mills. So that's a little bit more in the details of what we've been It's good detail. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and speaking on what the mayor's saying, um, all the reading I've been doing is saying that there's actually more trees today than there were 100 years ago. Because of the policies, right? When we used to cut the trees down, we plant them. And these, I'm hearing that these trees are planted way too thin. And now we have, this is when less is you know, more. We're crowding out the forest and not allowing the tree to grow bigger and wider. So we have all these little tiny trees growing up here. And 100 years ago, you could ride horseback through the whole entire state. You can't do that now. It's just, it's just way too thick. And there needs to be a compromise where we uh, take this into, into consideration, right? To thin out the forest as part of the plan. Okay, let's stick with questions. Sir. I'd like to speak to that. It's not true that there was a forest for us here. This is the diary of the Alphabet Trail in 1846, and they described uh, dense forests all the way from Tonquil uh, to uh, California Mountains. And so it was a very difficult time, but that's the amount of uh, uh, underbrush in the forest was just as dense, if not denser then than it is now. Thank you for the comments. I really appreciate the robust dialogue on the issues. We're focusing in on the smoke management plan and we want to answer questions towards that. And then we want to have enough time at the end here to answer the private comments. That's, that's a great point to raise during the comment section. So questions and we'll continue from the front to the back. No, that's what not that's not the smoke management plan. Okay, so the question is is whether localized burning, backyard burning, that type of burning is part of what we're talking about here. No, it is not. We are talking about forestry management prescribed burning. So will there be changes in the current permit season uh, burning, I guess, around There's no changes to permitting whatsoever. This, that, that's outside of the scope of the smoke management plan. Yeah. I'm curious if all the western states that are affected, which are all of them, have the same process that we're hearing now. Are they going to be following the same rules that you're changing? I state? can't speak to all the states. Washington is going through the same process. But I can't speak to all the states. Everybody, every state has a little bit different <coughs> smoke management plan and they've got to handle it their way, and I don't have all that information. I have one more question about the county. Is Josephine County Red County Forestry Land that's now in its own way? So did the Josephine County Forestry Lands kind of follow the same rules for prescribed burning? Because I know that we have prescribed burning on this land. Forest managed lands in Josephine County follow the smoke management plan like every other county in the state. The same thing. Essentially the same thing. Yeah. Prescribed basically means that it is a managed burn. We intentionally light it for management purposes. And that's basically what a control burn is. So far as the West is kind of on fire, and I was told yesterday that California is going to be looking at fires 365 days a year. That could be our future as well. I'm just wondering how the scope of the control burns can be, and the, and the time frame can be expanded to do more. Is it a question of finances from the federal government? Is it a question of, I mean, I realize you have all the, the facts and the figures and you need to work within those parameters, but is, is, what is holding, what is slowing the process down? We know we need to do this. There are a few limitations, some of which we can control and some which we cannot. Uh, smoke management, we can, we can change the rules. 
that's one way we can do it to allow for a greater usage of prescribed burning, which we're proposing. There's also resources, whether it's manpower or money. That is also another limiting factor. And another factor, uh, <coughs> factor is weather, which we cannot control. So burning has to take place under certain prescriptions of how moist versus how dry it is. So we want to do controlled burning under uh, the sweet spot where the burning can take place, but it's not too hot and dry, and it's not too wet, so it can actually burn. So, yeah. yes, sir. Two questions. One is, um, where is the U.S. Forest Service? I see Oregon Department, and I see DEQ, but where is the U.S. Forest Service? I mean this. The U.S. Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management and all federal agencies have to follow the smoke management plan just like state and private. So they, but how are they in terms of control of, of burns? in their areas and, and doing the control burns? They are doing the same thing that uh, the others are. In fact, they are probably doing more. They, they have to, their lands oftentimes are, are not as much uh, cut as private lands are, so they have to do what's called underburning within the forest to try to mimic wildfire to reduce the fuels on the ground. And the other question? Just a minute, I, I, I need to go to somebody else. we we got quite a few, go ahead, man. Um, yes, I'm about navigate, and we have the board and ownership of the. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I can't quite hear. Navigate where uh, if I drive on my driveway, I just got on the BLM land. So communication with land, <coughs> how is that going to increase? I mean, I, I, it's it's vital that we know when you're coming and where you're going because we're so close to the path. So the question is, um, how are we going to increase our communication for landowners about prescribed burning when they might be happening or um, where they might be happening, especially in the checkerboard uh, parts of the state? Well, are you concerned about the landowner or are you concerned about the public who's potentially going to be impacted by the smoke? The landowner is next door to where you're going to burn it. Well, the landowners in and of themselves are pretty aware of what their neighbors are doing. And that hasn't been really an issue. Uh, it's, it's how much the public knows about the smoke and whether it's an impact to us. So we have not addressed that issue in the smoke management plan. I'll just add that uh, part of our communication efforts is to reach out to the community, and that includes landowners. So part of our, um, our efforts to increase our communication ability with communities will also cover how we um, communicate with landowners as well. Uh, just a quick question. I appreciate the comment that you work with communities. And um, we have a lot of communities here and your stakeholders in the process. In that, why wouldn't you consider your county commissions as an essential stakeholder in your process? I would say that we do consider our county commissions as essential stakeholders in the process, and that's one of the reasons why we had county commissioners present on our stakeholder, on our um, rules advisory committee. Um, and that's also part of the process, reasons why in this exemption evaluation, Board of Forestry included an evaluation of our, any plans that might happen for an exemption to go through a local evaluation to make sure that it aligns with the objectives of your community. So I would say that it is, the DEQ would definitely feel that our commissioners are important stakeholders that we want to work with. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier uh, that you're tracking the smoke and intrusions. Uh, with the current wildfires, we're seeing significant burnout operations. That's just putting up ridiculous particulars. We sit here tonight, it's 218, very unhealthy. So, you said you do this 365 days a year, you track smoke intrusions. How are you tracking the wildfire management and these burnouts they're putting out, which is creating a lot of the unhealthy air quality we have right now? What you're asking is really outside of the scope of our business. Wildfire burning is outside of prescribed fire. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying talking to smoke management. Yeah. I know, smoke management for prescribed burning, not for wildfire. So are we playing semantics on that? Because the health effect is the same. Right, so do you were concerned about wildfire smoke impacts, and we've used uh, this technique of the smoke uh, protocols, working with the U.S. Forest Service, 
our health authorities, the local county health, health authorities, to communicate on impacts that might be coming from wildfire smoke. And you know, it, it's something that's uh, hard to control, right? Wildfires are wildfires for a reason. But there's some, there's uh, techniques that we can use to communicate with the public on how to protect yourself, when smoke is coming, where it's, uh, where it's coming from, and um, things that you can do to, to take uh, your health, health into consideration, and who you can go to to get uh, more information on how the smoke might, might be impacting you. So we've been uh, working collaboratively with our partners at the Oregon Health Authority, at the Department of Forestry, at the U.S. Forest Service, with the National Weather Service, all these agencies, to make sure that we're communicating with the public on how these wildfires Well, then let me clarify that question. If you're saying this is a policy and a procedure that has to be followed, how are they being exempted on the wildfires? Do they not have to follow the same policy and procedure? I'm not sure I understand your question. How Come on. <laughs> Answer the question. There's, there's no secret plan with that. We don't have rules on how you fight wildfires. It's, it's basically you're trying to put the fire out. And however you do that, whether it's a burnout operation to fight fire with fire, or you're putting out we all live in tall water or something like that. We need to put we're trying to suppress the fire itself. And like I said, wildfire is, is totally different than prescribed burning. Our prescribed burning is trying to reduce the amount of wildfire in a long term level. But on a short term we don't have control over wildfire. That's why they are wildfires. So there's no communication between your organizations and the fires, and there's no discussion about the current environmental conditions when they get ready to do a burnout, and if it's appropriate to do it or not for smoke management? There is not. That's a big flaw. Not, not for smoke management. 